Well, tonight we're going to be in, in uh, chapter 4 of, uh, of 1 Corinthians. And, and as we read our text tonight, I want you to look for, um, look for a couple of things that Paul kind of brings up um, from previously mentioned points that we've had together. So um, as we read, starting in chapter 4, verse 1, we're going to see him kind of uh, echoing what he said in chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, that apostles are servants. Mika, we talked about that a couple weeks ago. And then he's going to echo what he uh, wrote in chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, that uh, the, the coming judgment where God will come and judge us, judge all of us. So he's kind of bringing the first three chapters and kind of bringing them back into, into one train of thought in chapter 4, verse 1. He's also going to pick up the language of, of examining and judging um, while making it abundantly clear that the Corinthian church had been kind of stirring the pot and passing judgment on the, on the apostles. This is when Paul really starts to kind of lay into, first, into the Corinthian church a little bit. And um, I love Paul. One of the reasons I love Paul's writings is because there is a level of sarcasm. Um, we'll get into more next week. Uh, but Paul, Paul's not afraid to uh, say what he thinks and, and do it with some uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek wording. So chapter 4, verse 1. It would help if I would turn there before I started trying to read it. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I... I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring light, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So we see here um, Paul's defense of his ministry coming back to the surface. Um, he points to the fact that uh, um, these apostles are servants of, God, of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. What are the mysteries of God he's referring to? He, he's referring to, to, to God's word, God's revelation, right? He, he's saying that the apostles are stewards to the truth and the message of God. Um, now, the idea of apostolic calling and stewardship is kind of foreign to Southern Baptist churches. We don't talk about... Um, you know, the apostles and, and our responsibility or the, the responsibility of the apostles. Um, but, but the apostles were um, people that were sent out with a message. They were sent out with, with um, like he says here, they were stewards of the mysteries of God. They, they had a calling to go and share. In the New Testament, apostles were sent out with a message. And, and Paul here says that uh, there is a responsibility of those who were sent, Right. The responsibility was that stewardship. And even though today in, in Southern Baptist churches and in these pews, we don't really talk about apostles much in today's context, I think we would all agree that each one of us sitting in here are, are stewards to a message that we've been entrusted to go out and, and do something with, right? What message is that? Yeah, the gospel, the, the words of Jesus Christ. Um, Matthew twenty eight nineteen is the Great Commission. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 8 says uh, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit will come on you and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, into the earth. I mixed all that up. But all that remains, our responsibility, your responsibility is to take the, the gospel, the, the mysteries of God that's been revealed to you through the Holy Spirit, the, the truths of Jesus, the truths of Scripture, and not to be hoarders of the hope that we have, but to be stewards of it. And by a steward, it means to responsibly go and share and take it to other people. Right? Does that make sense? So, um, 
just like Paul, you and I are, are in that same boat. Verse 2 says, It is required of stewards that they may be found faithful. It is required of stewards that they may be found faithful. It does not say it is required of those stewards that they may be successful or that they may win great numbers, right? Uh, the, the theologian and um, New Testament professor Gordon Fee says that the metric is not eloquence, nor wisdom, nor initiative, nor success, but it is faithfulness. Faithfulness is what God requires of his servants. Faithfulness to do what you've been called to do. Now, on a personal level, this brings me both relief and conviction. If we think about the fact that we're not responsible for the response of, other, uh, of the lost, right? If you share the gospel with your waiter at Chili's, you are not responsible with how he responds to it. Whether he says, go kick rocks, or whether he breaks down and cries, or whether he um, spills your sweet tea on you just because he doesn't like it, whatever, you're not responsible for that, but you are responsible for your faithfulness to share and what you do with it. So it's, it's a relief to me because it removes every man-made marker of success. It, it removes all that. It, it removes the, the, uh, the, the marker of numbers within, uh, within ministry and in the church. Um, it removes the fact that we have to count numbers and see who's here, and, and, and we, we constantly fight the urge of um, we, we want more people. And, and I get the argument that more people in a pew or more people in your Sunday school classes, more people that are hearing the message, and, and it's important to, to engage with people, right? But the number of people in a pew is not the metric of success in the faithfulness of the stewards of, of Jesus Christ. It's, it's the growth. It's, it's, the, it's what you're doing with what you've been given. Um, I don't have to convince people to be saved. And I want you to hear this. You are not responsible to convince people to be saved. Mike, it's awesome that you share the gospel with, with your sons and, and they're thinking about it and, and those things, you know, that they, they prayed that prayer. That is phenomenal. But you and I both know um, you could not force them to it, right? Even my kids who are, who are younger, they're still living at home. Um, you can't force salvation. You can't force them to be a disciple. But you can and you should have those conversations and talk about it and let it be a part of the life and the culture in your home, right? Um, that's, the respons that's, that's the responsibility of stewardship that we have as parents or you have as grandparents or aunts, uncles, or whatever. But here's the deal. Where it convicts me is... I am still responsible with what I do with what God's given me. As a believer, there are things in this book that I'm the mysteries of God that I understand. A lot of things I don't. But the simple truths of salvation, I get it. And, and what convicts me is I am accountable before God for what I do with that gospel message not with how I convince or whatever else, but with what I do with it. Um, let's look at 1 Corinthians 4.3. Paul keeps writing. I love this. I love, this just cracks me up. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. He's telling them, I don't give a rip what you're saying about me. Your judgment of me means absolutely nothing. I, I wish more Christians would have that mindset. What would it look like? Don't answer this, but just think about it. What would it look like in your own personal walk with Christ if you were at the point, the, if you were at a place of, of such confidence in your identity in Jesus and your calling in Christ that you could honestly say, I don't care what Mika thinks about me or what Miss Linda thinks about me or what Mike thinks about me. 
I don't care what Lori is saying about me at Chili's. I know what God's called me to do, and I'm going to do it. How freeing would that be? How freeing would it be to be at a place where we could say, you know what? Only God can judge me. It does not matter what the the court of public opinion thinks about me. It does not matter what my family is saying about me. It doesn't matter that my friends didn't invite me to this shindig. Um, it doesn't, it, none of this matters. The only thing that matters is what my Heavenly Father is saying. Would that change the game a little bit? Um, yeah. Right. But, but because that's our human nature, does that give us, does that give us a cop-out? No, I mean, we're, we're supposed to strive towards Christ-likeness, not conformity to the world. Romans 12 says, don't be conformed to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need to have a changed mindset. And that changed mindset comes from spending time in the mysteries of God that he has given us. So, so he, he tells them, stop judging me. I don't care what you say. I'm not even judging myself. Only God can judge me. Now, his, his comment, um, he says, I'm not aware of anything against myself. This does not mean I'm innocent and I'm sinless. If you read other letters that Paul wrote, um, he, he's very aware of his shortcomings, right? We talked earlier about judging ourselves in light of our walk with Jesus and these things. We, we're aware of where we fall short. I mean, he even says in... Um, I think it's Romans 7, uh, Paul says, paraphrased, I don't do the things that I want to do, and I do do the things I don't want to do. Paul's very aware that he's got his own struggles. But what he's saying is, um, God is the one that's going to judge them, not man. So these few verses are the segue into verse 5, where he says, do not, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Hey, listen, there will be a day where God will pull the covers back, not over just the actions of man, but the heart of man. He will pull into the light everything that's been done in the dark. Every thought, every heart issue, every action, every deed, everything that has been done in sin and sinfulness, he will bring it to the light and he will judge it. Now, the challenge with this is that the judgment day of the Lord is coming and we're all getting what's coming to us, right? Every single one of us will stand before the Lord one day and give an account. And, and for those that are poor stewards of the gospel that we've been entrusted to, entrusted with, um, we will have to give an account for that. For the holy hoarders who want to keep and hold on to and, and, and keep for themselves the, the, the things of God, um, they will stand before God and have to give an account. For those who, who accepts that call to go and, and to be a steward and, and be faithful in that message and to, to do something with it, um, they're going to stand before God and, and, and Lord willing, they're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Again, I want to reiterate the fact that we're called to obedience. We're not called to man to find success. Um, well, I mean, was it, was it on a Wednesday night a few weeks ago, uh, last month, I guess, you, you, you gave the story about the, the big pastor and the big conference and across the street was the small church. And you talked about the faithfulness of, of the, the pastors. Um, you know, we, we hear stories of, of, of church plants that struggle for years, but they're faithful. And, and they may grow to a church of 25 or 50, and, and they just keep pressing along, and they're serving the community, and they're doing things, and 
that growth is just really, really slow and it's hard work and they're in the, trench, in the trenches. And then you hear other, other stories of church planners or missionaries who go into a new area and uh, six months later, there's 400 people coming to church. One of those guys is no more um, righteous or holy or faithful than the other. O- obedience is what we're called to. So it's obedience to, to take the gospel into our veterinary clinic office and just be light. We don't have to fix the problems of the world. We, we, we don't have to walk in with a solution to everyone's issues. I mean, I guess we do because the solution to a lot of those issues are Jesus, right? We, but we, we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to persuade them to do this or that. We're just called to be obedient to what we've been entrusted to, and that's the light of Jesus. It's being salt. It's being light in the darkness. It's being set apart, being different. We all know the analogies. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You've been called to be set apart. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Your life, whatever you do in your life, should glorify God. That's what we've been entrusted to. Um, today's, t- tonight's text is, is a, a word of, of encouragement to the Corinthians and to us, telling them um, and telling us that uh, um, you don't have to worry about everyone's opinion. But it's also a call to repentance. Because I can speak for myself. Um, I ashamedly can think of countless times where I have not steward, I have not been a good steward of the calling and the message and the hope that Jesus has entrusted to me. And, and for that, I need to find time to repent and seek forgiveness from the Lord. And, and you know, repentance is not just saying I'm sorry, but it's saying I'm sorry and redirecting what we do, right? Repentance is turning away from. And so if I repent from, from disobedience or poor stewardship, it's not just enough to say, hey, I've kind of stunk it up but there needs to be some action to it. Um, and so tonight, tonight's challenge is this. I want to ask you two questions. I want you to reflect and answer them to yourself. How faithful have you been as, as stewards of the gospel he's given you? How faithful have you been as stewards of the gospel he's given you? And the second question is, how prepared are you for the day he will bring the darkness into the light. How prepared are you for the day he will bring the darkness into the light? Those are kind of heavy questions. And again, I want you to, I want to encourage you just to reflect on those. I want to pray to close this real quick, and then I'll stop the recording, and then we'll open it up to discussion, questions, thoughts, um, and then we will close the night in praying for our missionaries and planters and and the ministries of Central, okay? Lord, again, we thank you. God, I pray that you would continue to convict my heart and and help me to become more aware of of the times that I drop the ball in stewardship. Lord, I pray that you would um, help us to recognize the responsibility and the privilege and the calling that you've placed on each one of us to, um, to, to carry the gospel with us and and to be the, the light in the darkness. Um, Lord, I, I pray for this community around us. I pray for the circles of influence as represented by each person in this room. Um, Lord, I pray that you would give each one of us a, um, a, a new boldness to, to stand firm in, the, in the, the confidence of Jesus Christ and, and our identity and who we are uh, through you. Lord, we again love you and we thank you. And, Um, Thank you for what you've done in our lives individually, Lord. We thank you for the ways we've seen you move in the past uh, week or so and and the ways we've celebrated that tonight. Lord, I thank you for the way you're working um, in our lives and around us. And Lord, we just pray that you continue to do that. We pray that you would give us um, the the energy and the strength and desire uh, to, to go with you and join you in where you're working. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. All of God's people said... Amen.